Hello and welcome to this GCSE Chemistry explanation video about corrosion and its prevention. In this video we'll start by looking at what the causes of corrosion and rusting are and then we'll move from there into looking at how we can prevent corrosion and we'll finish by studying an investigation into proving the chemicals needed for rusting to occur. Corrosion is a natural process that involves the deterioration or destruction of materials by chemical reactions with substances in the environment, specifically oxygen and water. Corrosion only happens at the surface of the metal where it's exposed to the air, specifically the oxygen from the air, and this is where it can also come into contact with water. The process of corrosion not only affects the appearance of the metal, but also its structural integrity, and this can lead to potential safety hazards. In this topic, when we talk about corrosion, we are going to be meaning the corrosion of metals. But you will have heard of a similar word, corrosive, in the acids topic. And for something to be corrosive, it means it can cause damage to living tissue or metal or other materials when it comes into contact with them. And so that type of substance should be handled with extreme care. Rusting is probably the most common example of corrosion. And rusting is a process that only occurs to iron. And so rust is what forms once iron has corroded. And like all types of corrosion, both oxygen and water are necessary for the iron to rust and the rust will form at the surface of the piece of iron where it's been exposed to the air and to water. And when rust occurs, it's really soft and crumbly and it flakes off and that means more iron from underneath the bit that's just rusted will be exposed and so this will rust again and again. And so eventually all of the iron in an object can corrode away even if it wasn't there at the surface initially. Not only do you need to remember that oxygen and water are required for iron to rust, you need to be able to write this as a chemical equation. And so we have iron reacting with oxygen and also water as our reactants on the left hand side of the equation and they are converted into hydrated iron 3 oxide, which is the chemical name for rust. And that's the compound that has the characteristic brown colour that you associate with something that has gone rusty. And as I've said before, only iron rusts, but corrosion can produce similar compounds after other metals have corroded, but only iron will rust. Rust is called hydrated iron 3 oxide, and that's because it contains iron in the 3 plus charge ion. And this iron 3 plus ion has been encountered in another topic in chemistry. This has links to the chemical analysis topic, specifically when you use sodium hydroxide solution to test for the presence of metal ions. When you add sodium hydroxide, to a test tube containing iron 3 plus ions, you get a characteristic brown colored precipitate or rust colored. And there's a reason why this precipitate looks rust colored and that is that rust and this precipitate both contain the same ion, iron 3 plus. We use metals for a huge number of different types of structure and a lot of these are outside and it can be really, really important that we prevent these structures from corroding because over time the metal structures will become weaker and weaker and so something like a bridge can be particularly dangerous if it has corroded because it can become weaker and there is the risk that it will break and cause an accident. Corrosion requires both oxygen and water and so therefore preventing corrosion will usually mean preventing either one or both of oxygen or water coming into contact with the metal that you want to protect or from preventing it reacting with the metal once it has come into contact with it. The most common method of preventing corrosion is to use some kind of barrier that will literally block access to the metal and stop oxygen and water coming into contact with the metal that you're trying to protect. 
For instance, if you've got some moving parts that you need to protect and they need to move with reasonably little friction, you might oil them and grease them and this will provide the friction that they need to move smoothly whilst also providing a barrier that stops the oxygen and water coming into contact with them. And this is for moving parts in car engines and, and bicycle chains and things like that. Alternatively, you might paint the metal and painting is probably the most common. To do this, you need to make sure that this metal is going to not move around very much and so that the paintwork won't get chipped off with its movement. And so things like bridges and fences and small structures are very commonly painted and this will keep out the oxygen and the water for a long period of time. And unless it gets chipped, that will be quite a reliable method of preventing the rusting process of an iron bridge, for instance. The third most common way of providing a barrier to prevent corrosion is to use electroplating. And this is something that's used where you get a metal and you coat it with another metal using the process of electrolysis. And we deposit this metal on top of our iron, for instance, and this will mean that the iron underneath the surface won't corrode away. Aluminium is another metal that can corrode when it comes into contact with oxygen and water from the air. But unlike when iron rusts, when aluminium corrodes, it is slightly less destructive. And the aluminium oxide that forms on the surface of the aluminium metal doesn't actually flake away and fall apart and expose the aluminium underneath. This aluminium oxide sticks to the surface of the aluminium metal and it acts as a barrier and protects the metal from further corrosion by preventing water and oxygen from the air from reacting with the metal. And so it's almost as if this aluminium reacts partially and creates its own barrier on the surface and prevents access to the metal beneath the surface. And you can notice this when you react aluminium with things such as acids. You could get a piece of aluminium and it will just look like a, a grey silver piece of metal and you won't be able to tell that there's aluminium oxide on its surface until you put that aluminium into a beaker or a test tube containing acid. Because what can happen is you can get misleading results and it can seem like the aluminium is less reactive than it truly is because what happens is the outer aluminium oxide layer needs to react first and then once that aluminium oxide layer has reacted with the acid that you've put it into, the reaction will speed up because you will expose this aluminium, which is quite a reactive metal, to the acid that has just reacted with the aluminium oxide layer. And so at first glance, the aluminium can be quite low reactivity, but then it will speed up as the reaction goes on once that oxide layer has reacted away. Sometimes it might be impractical to use a barrier to prevent corrosion and this could be because you might change the properties of the thing that you're trying to protect or the barrier might get chipped away. And so another method that we can use is something called sacrificial protection. And when you're using sacrificial protection, you need to attach a more reactive metal to the metal that you're trying to protect. And what this means is when oxygen and water come into contact with the object, the sacrificial metal will react instead of the less reactive metal. And this is used sometimes in iron pipework and on the hulls of ships. And zinc and magnesium are quite common sacrificial metals to attach to the hull of a ship that might be made of iron. And this works because the magnesium is much more reactive than iron. You might get presented with a situation that you've never encountered before and you might be expected to work out that what's being described is sacrificial protection. And so something that you need to keep in mind for this un unfamiliar situation is that you might need to explore the metal's reactivity and say, right, well, metal X is more reactive than metal Y and so it will provide sacrificial protection and metal X will react or corrode instead of the metal that you're trying to protect.
Sometimes it's possible to prevent iron or steel from going rusty by taking particular care when you're producing it to make a type of steel called stainless steel. All types of steel is an alloy, which is iron typically mixed in with other elements such as carbon. But when you're making stainless steel, you also mix in a small amount of chromium or nickel as well. And having done that, you no longer have your pure iron and you've got an alloy that is resistant to corrosion. And so it won't react when it comes into contact with water or oxygen. And that makes it really suitable for certain types of objects such as cutlery and things like that. But it's not quite as strong as you might typically need for big structures such as a bridge and it would probably also be quite expensive as well because of the extra elements that you need to add whilst you're making the alloy. Some techniques for preventing corrosion can provide both a barrier and a sacrificial method of protection. And an example of this is zinc, which can be used to galvanize iron. And this means that there is a coating of zinc around the outside of the iron object, maybe a nail, and what that means is the zinc prevents access to the iron. And if the nail gets scratched and the zinc coating gets worn off in one area of the nail, the zinc's higher reactivity than iron means that if oxygen and water come into contact with the nail, the zinc will react preferentially and it will react instead of the iron. In an exam, you could be asked to either plan an investigation into rusting or to analyse somebody's results. What this investigation would involve is exploring different methods of preventing rusting of iron. And so in the investigation, you would have some identical iron nails and you would try in one investigation to deny it access to oxygen and then in another deny it access to water. And those should, in theory, prevent the formation of the hydrated iron 3 oxide, also known as rust. So our independent variable is the method of rust prevention. For our dependent variable, we have some choices. We could simply just say whether or not the nail goes rusty, or we could say what is the extent of the rusting, or even better, what is the increasing mass of the nail? Because the best method of rust prevention will have the smallest increase in mass. And we would expect that mass to increase because as the iron nail reacts with oxygen and water to make the hydrated iron 3 oxide, the iron becomes heavier because it also has oxygen and hydrogen atoms as part of the rust structure. Whenever you do an investigation, in order for it to be valid, we need to make sure we control as many of the other factors that might affect the experiment as possible. So I've already said we would want those iron nails to be identical, so identical size. We wouldn't want any of them to be stainless steel or galvanized and some of them to just be pure iron because that would affect the results. We would also want to make sure we leave them for the same length of time in rooms that are the same temperature, because obviously leaving them for longer or in a hotter environment might mean it will rust more. And so if we'd been asked to write a method in an exam question, we would just need to keep it nice and brief. So we would say that we would set up three test tubes, each containing an identical iron nail. In the first tube, we would leave this tube open to the air and we would add some water. What this would allow us to do is to prove that water and oxygen are required for rusting because when they are both present, hopefully that first iron nail will go rusty. And then we'd need to have a second tube and perhaps we would stop at that tube or put some kind of lid on it and we would add a drying agent to the inside of that tube. Drying agents absorb moisture from the air and so therefore they, the air inside this tube would not have any water vapour in it and so when the iron is left it won't go rusty in theory because there won't be any water for it to react with. And so the lid, of course, will prevent any moisture from the outside air from getting in. So the drying agent will be able to absorb water, but not an infinite amount of water.
And then the third tube, what we might do is we might put the iron nail underneath a layer of boiled water. When we boil water, we're likely to drive off any oxygen that is dissolved in that water. And so that means that there will be a, a layer of water preventing any oxygen from getting into contact with that iron nail. But there will be lots of water there. But then oxygen will dissolve in this water over time if we're not careful. So what we're likely to do is put a layer of oil on top of that water. And since oil is less dense than water, it will float on the surface and it will prevent any oxygen dissolving in that water. And so we would expect this nail to not go rusty because there wouldn't be any oxygen to cause that rusting. And the middle tube, we'd expect that one to not go rusty because there's no water to react with the iron. Whereas the first one, we would expect to go rusty if we left that for a period of a few days or a week, say. We'd leave all three of these tubes probably for a week and then we'd observe the results and compare the level of rusting that we see. Another way that you could be asked to think about the rusting investigation is to be presented with an experiment that somebody is either going to do and you could be asked to make predictions about what you'd expect to happen or you could be told that they have done the experiment and be asked to explain the results that they've got. And so what you would be presented with would be a series of test tubes or boiling tubes with an iron nail in each of them and the conditions for each of these iron nails that they've been left in for a period of days would be different. And so if we make some predictions, first of all, we've got our first tube where you've got the iron nail, which is in the presence of air. So the oxygen is present and there is water as well. And so you would expect this tube to go rusty. In the second tube, we also have got the water, so that's present, and there's oxygen as well, but there is a barrier because this iron nail has been painted. So we wouldn't expect this iron nail to go rusty because neither the oxygen nor the water can come into contact and therefore react with the nail. In the third tube, we've got the water and we've got the air, there is a barrier, the nail has been painted, but there is a scratch down the side of this nail, which means that the barrier is ineffective. And so we would expect this nail to rust, perhaps not as much as the first tube or as quickly, because remember, rusting only happens at the surface of the nail and most of this surface is not exposed. In the fourth tube, we've got the water and the oxygen, but the iron nail has been wrapped around with magnesium. Magnesium is much more reactive than iron, so we wouldn't expect any rusting to occur because the magnesium will effectively be a sacrificial metal and it will react instead of the iron. In the fifth experiment, we've got air, so the oxygen is present, but there's calcium chloride or some kind of drying agent, which means that this air will be completely dry. There won't be any water to react with. And so the nail will not go rusty. And there's a rubber stopper in the top of the tube, which means no damp air can enter the tube and react with the nail. So no rusting in tube five. We'd also not expect there to be any rusting in tube six. There is water, lots of it. The nail is completely covered in water, but because the water has been boiled, there is no oxygen going to be present in that water. And there's a, a layer of oil on the top, preventing more oxygen coming into contact with the water and dissolving in it. And so no rusting can occur because we've only got the water that is needed for the rusting to occur. If we'd been presented with some results, we could be asked to explain them using the exact same reasoning that we've just used. And if we'd been given numbers about the masses of these nails before and after, we would expect most of these nails to not gain any mass because they haven't rusted at all. So tubes two, four, five, and six would not gain any mass because they haven't rusted, but tube one and tube three would rust and so their mass would increase and you'd expect tube one to increase the most because it has been exposed at the greatest surface area for the oxygen and the water to react with. And so its mass would increase the most. And so this experiment is proving that water and oxygen are both needed for rusting to occur because if we deny that iron nail either one of those chemicals or both of them, we wouldn't see any rusting at all. Okay. That's the end of this video. I hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.